Hi there. Welcome to Business Leadership Podcast. In this podcast, I interview successful business leaders and industry experts to help you grow your business. I truly believe that sometimes single insight can completely change your business directions and allow you to achieve your business goals. In this episode, my guest is founder at Trust Unlimited. He's one of the world's leading experts on a trust. He teaches leaders how to find and use a most powerful tool, which is building trust in our relationships. He has a PhD in a building trust in a hostile environment from Duke. He worked as a consultant at McKinsey and a company and taught his method um, in universities and in boardrooms around the world. You know, this was a very interesting discussion. We talked about many different topics. And as you know, for the last few years during this disruption, everybody's working remotely and, and we all going through so much on, on a personal level or professionally, financially or economically. And, uh, you know, during this, this uh, you know, so much uh, uncertainty in our environment, sometimes building trust could be a little bit difficult. And, you know, business leaders, we used to build uh, trust, you know, in person when, when we meet each other, but working in a hybrid environment, building a trust is a little bit different skill set. So Daryl's an expert on that. We talk about many different topics around building trust, you know, how to still achieve goals and, and move companies forward. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, Daryl Stickle. Hi guys, welcome to Business Leadership Podcast. Today, my guest is someone very special from Vancouver all the way, Daryl Stickle. Uh, Daryl, thank you so much for joining me and, uh, you know, thank you so much for time. Um, you know, go ahead, sorry. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Gurmeet. It's fantastic to get a chance to talk with you and your audience. Thank you. You know, um, we, this time and what we just gone through with the disruption, you know, um, that the, your expertise in the area, I'm looking forward to learning about, you know, business is all about people. It's about building trust and building relationships. And that's where your ex expertise are. So I'm always looking forward to learning, for, you know, learning more about this topic. So I'm looking forward to our discussion and learning more from you on, on this topic, Daryl. It's my pleasure. It's my passion to help people better understand what trust is and how it works and and most importantly how to how to take steps to build it i see so just walk us through like how do, how do you help your your client like what, what is what is that you know how do you build trust and you know how, you know and first if you can define a little bit what is a trust when it comes to uh you know people working together so the, that's a great question because a lot of times the struggle we have is a lack of awareness and and we sometimes don't have the same definition mm -hmm. and i define trust as a willingness to make yourself vulnerable when you can't completely predict how someone else is going to behave. And so there's an element of vulnerability and uncertainty there. Yeah. Um, and so when I think about trust, I think about it in terms of, you know, we ask ourselves two fundamental questions. The first question is how likely am I to be harmed, which is perceived uncertainty. Okay. And the next question is if I'm harmed, how bad is it going to hurt, which is perceived vulnerability. Uh, and okay. Those, those act as the basis for trust. And if we, if we think about it, it's uncertainty times vulnerability gives us a level of perceived risk. And if we each have a threshold of risk that we're comfortable with, if we go beyond that threshold, then we don't trust. But if we're beneath it, then we do. Hmm. And so that framework allows us to think about relationships, whether it's within our businesses or our personal lives or wherever it might be. If we've got really high levels of uncertainty, we can only tolerate small ranges of vulnerability. And as our relationships get deeper, that means that the uncertainty starts to come down. The range of vulnerability we can tolerate starts to get bigger. Wow. So how do you understand that level of uncertainty level of range? Is like, how do, you, how do you understand, you know, it's dynamically, you know, changes people to people, you know, situation to situation. So how do you, how do you assess that? You know, are you not crossing a line? Yeah. Okay. So that's fantastic. You're, <laughs> you're ahead of the curve. Okay. Um, so what I do is I systematically walk people through where does uncertainty come from? Okay. And then how do we take steps to reduce it? Where do our perceptions of vulnerability come from and how do we take steps to reduce those? And so for me, uncertainty comes from two places. It comes from you and I as individuals, but it also comes from the context that we're embedded in. And for me, you just jumped ahead of where 99% of academics are when they talk about trust because they Thank almost you. only talk about uncertainty mm -hmm. and they almost only talk about the individual. And so mm -hmm. brilliant insight you know, I've been studying this for 20 years and, and helping people sort of solve trust problems for about, you know, most of my career. Mm -hmm. um, and your sort of immediate jump to, Hey, the context has a role. It plays a, that's, you're just bang on. 
Mm -hmm. Well, context is a big role. You know, we we could have a same discussion over beer, and and we may not. You know, we we very easy to deal with a lot of situations. So we, we you know we not even seeing each other the same way. But exactly. I could have a same discussion in a boardroom with you, and and now we're a totally different situation where where responsibility changes. You know, everything changes. You know, so so that can have play change. The, rule changes. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, the example I tend to use is a doctor's office, right? You, you yeah. go to a doctor's office, they say, take off your clothes and you do. And mm. Gurmeet, I've tried that in other places. It doesn't work, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, and if we, if we took that, those same two people and shifted them to a different setting, right? If we were, yeah. okay, it's a doctor's office. The guy walks in with the white coat or the, or the gal walks in with the white coat, pulling on a pair of latex gloves, says, take off your clothes. You're kind of like, yeah, okay. But now let's say you're in a washroom at a gas station, same person walks through the door of the bathroom and they, they're pulling on a pair of latex gloves and they say, take off your clothes. It goes from credible to creepy in a heartbeat. Yeah. Right. And so you're absolutely right. The context plays a huge role and, and that helps explain why sometimes we trust people without knowing much about them at all. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes we don't trust people without knowing much about them at all. You know, the, the, label for that is racism mm -hmm. um you know we we are seeing a, a split in our society where we we either trust people because they believe the same things or they look the same as us or they worship the same way we do or we don't trust them because they don't do those things mm -hmm. and and so an understanding of the context is is a really powerful step in us and, and so what we want to do in those settings is because we're sort of aware of our context but we're not completely fleshed out on it mm -hmm. so you and i are having this great conversation and and i know about your work on leadership and i know about your background and and so i know some of the things that drive you i know parts of your context that explain you to me and allow me mm -hmm. to predict your behavior and you know that i study trust we were introduced by someone we both like mm -hmm. a great deal and have respect for yeah and so so you've got a sense of the approach that i'm going to take to the world as well well, the way we build trust in the context is by explaining how we're constrained so that other people are more easily able to predict us. We reduce uncertainty mm -hmm. by being clear, you know, and, and so I can tell you things about myself that make it easier for you to, to understand how I'm going to behave mm -hmm. and, and how I'm going to engage with the world. You know, uh, let me let me put another with the business leaders, like a business owner running a business. I'll, you know, we, we interact with the people and I know a lot of uh, my colleagues, they hire people just on an instinct. You know, hey, I get a good feel about this person. Right. So yeah. um, you don't know a lot about it. You, you saw a piece of paper that, you know, and uh, especially with the vendors, you know, most business leaders, I know they make a very quick decision. And most of the decision is a gut feeling and instinct. Yeah. How does that that play a role? You don't have a lot of context when you make decisions on ongoing basis, but you you know something about the person, right? So, and how do you get better at that? Um, if if you, if that's even uh, possible to get better, I think it, over the time you get better. But is there a better way to to get better at it? Yeah, partly we get experience, right? And this is one yeah. of the struggles we have is, you know, the approach that I take is to try to raise people's awareness, because sometimes we'll get this feeling in our stomach, oh, not here, I'm uncomfortable. And, and we leave those situations without asking questions. Or sometimes we get a, a feeling in our stomach like, yeah, this is a good, you know, we get these instincts. And we're not as aware of those things. And we're not as aware of the impact we're having on others when we engage with them. Mm -hmm. And so you and I start having a conversation. I just like you, right? I, I tend to have a positive feel for you. I, I get a sense of what you're about in the world. And so I start to think, Gurmeet's a good guy. I'd love to be on his podcast. I'd love to, you know, talk to his uh, listeners. And I'm happy to share anything I know with this group of folks. Mm -hmm. Well, when we start to unpack that, there's elements of us as individuals that we're unconsciously communicating. And what I try to help people do is become more aware, more consciously competent, more intentional. Mm -hmm. So I think about levers that we can pull. So we each have the ability to build trust. Some are better than others, right? And so those who are not very good have a lever that they pull. Usually it's the ability lever. I have these kinds of credentials. I've spoken at these places. I have this much experience. Those are, that's the ability lever. You talked about a piece of paper when we're hiring someone, it's, you know, their, their bio or their, their resume. But if someone can actually start to pull 
more than one lever. They get better at building trust. Mm -hmm. And those who are really good know how to pull multiple levers and they know when to pull which one. And so the three levers for us as individuals are benevolence, integrity, and ability. And benevolence is the belief you've got my best interest at heart, that you'll act in my best interest. Integrity is, do I follow through on my commitments and do my actions align with the values that I express? And then ability is, do I actually have the confidence to do what I say I'm going to do? And Mm -hmm. and despite that being our favorite, we get it wrong fairly often because we, we define an ability on our own terms rather than thinking about our clients' terms yeah, or our uh, service providers' terms or our customers' terms or our employees' terms. And so what I do is I, I go through and I try to help people systematically understand how to pull those levers. And, you know, when I, when I work with folks who are, who are applying for senior roles, senior positions, I'll often say to them, hey, we pull the ability lever all the time. You show your resume, you show your history, you show your credentials, all that kind of stuff. But what we don't pull is the benevolence lever. And so mm-hmm. what if I'm sitting across from you, Gurmeet, and you're thinking about hiring me, and instead of saying, oh, I'm the greatest and I've got all this experience, I say to you, what are the biggest challenges that you're facing and how can I be helpful? Mm-hmm. And what what is the overlap between the role that you have and the role that I have? And what would a good colleague look like? And how do I help you be more successful? Because I know that that's going to lead to more success for the organization and indirectly for me. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, we're having a different conversation. And because you're not just hiring me to do a job, I'm going to be, you're going to be stuck with me, right? You're going to see more of me than you do of people you actually like. Mm -hmm. And so you're evaluating, can Daryl do the job? But also, is Daryl going to be painful to be around? Yeah. And if I start signaling to you that I care about you, that I care about your organization, it starts to give me a sense of, yeah, okay, this is someone I can work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is this is a critical piece. You know, I definitely I pay a lot of attention to that. You know, when when I'm you know going through either is a vendor or is it as a you know employee you hiring. Definitely, if you're putting these people in in touch with your client, you want to make sure that these people have that that cap- you know ability to build the trust. Um, not right. only with you, but go go and, and build with your clients and and, and go build with your uh, their colleagues as well, right? So right. So in context, what we just gone through with with the current disruption, you know, um, does that how important this got the trust piece, right? We work in all of, through technology, you know, on um, and we not in a, in, a, in a personal, you know, we don't have the personal communication where we're in front of each other, right? So we we behind this technology and, and definitely there's so much going on even in employee. If you look at it from employee yeah. standpoint. There's a financial challenge. There's a there's a physical. There's there's a mental health challenge. There's so many challenges people are dealing with. So yeah. how critical that trust become over the last few years? So uh, all the research tells us that trust drives profound value for organizations. It leads to higher returns to shareholders, uh, higher customer loyalty, more referrals, uh, more employee engagement. There's this thing we call organizational citizenship behaviors, right, where people mm-hmm. go above and beyond what their specific role is to try to serve the community that they're in, whether that's the organization or it's your customers. These are all the things that drive success for companies. And it's always been really important, but it's become even more important in these times of high turmoil and transition. And we're in such turbulent times. We've seen such a dramatic spike in uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And remember when I said, you know, if we have high uncertainty, then we can only tolerate small ranges of vulnerability. Well, let's think about how our employees are vulnerable to us mm-hmm. or un- vulnerable to the organization that they work with. That's It's where they get their money, their livelihood to pay their bills and you know maybe put their kids through school or uh, keep their house or keep their spouse happy or whatever it is. That's, mm-hmm. But it's also a place where they get their sense of self, yeah. where their goals and aspirations are, where a lot of their friends are their colleagues. It's part of their self-identity. And so there's a significant level of vulnerability attached to where we work. And as uncertainty starts to bounce, it creates profound discomfort. And Mm. when people start to get really uncomfortable, they start to try to find ways to reduce their vulnerability. So they start to disengage or they start to look for other jobs or they start to look for ways to control their life a little more effectively. Mm -hmm. And 
who are the ones we lose first, Gurmeet? They're the ones that we need the yeah. most. The yeah. most skilled people have the most options. And so trust has gone from being really important to incredibly vital. And mm-hmm. it's at the lowest levels we've ever measured because of these profound spikes in uncertainty. Mm-hmm. You know, there, we're losing trust in our our politicians, in our leaders, in our communities. You know, we're, we're seeing all these sort of symptoms of low trust levels. We're seeing protests. We're seeing, you know, profound disagreements about things like climate change, race relations, gender, religion, whatever it might be. And the challenge that's before us is that those problems, those are really big, hairy problems. Mm -hmm. And they require collective collaborative action for us to resolve. So so those are big problems that you just mentioned, Daryl. Um, we have no control over those items though, right? So we have a, some some input in it or some some impact, but we don't have a control. But can if you just handle the item that you control, can you still yes. still survive? Can you still build a trust with the people? Absolutely. Um, controlling within you, looking inside you or or just people around you, if you just focus on that, can you still build that that trustful environment that that where you can you can you can comfortably work? Absolutely. And I've done that for the last 20 years with individuals and organizations where yeah. they take control of the things they have control over. And building trust is a skill. It's a skill that we can build. And so we can get better at it. And then we create a safe harbor. How valuable is that for our clients and for our employees? If we've created a place where they feel safe and comfortable and people are looking out for them, they're willing to go through a wall for us. And customers, we create these sticky relationships where something goes wrong that's outside our control. Customers are going to give us the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. And as, as organizations grow and evolve and develop, you know, we're, we're seeing changes take place. The context is shifting. So as we move into more hybrid organizations or virtual teams or whatever that looks like as technology advances, or as we sort of, you know, increase our footprint in the world, um, it comes with potential uncertainty. And so if Mm -hmm. we can take active steps to reduce that, we can create an environment where people want to be. And the benefits are unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's so as you mentioned, it's a skill set, yeah, and you you get better at it. It's not some personality trait or some character in a person that you know whether it's person you know we, very often we meet somebody else and that person is not trustworthy. So, but it's a skill that person can develop if you if you give them the right environment and and the right guidance, and so they can develop that. In you know what you're saying that it's it's not a either you have it or if you don't or you don't have it. Right. This is one of the so we there's some barriers we face when we're trying to help people build trust. Mm-hmm. Um. One is that 95% of people believe they're more trustworthy than average. And aside from being statistically impossible, that means that every time we run into a problem, we think it's somebody else's issue to deal with. And so taking that internal, hey, I could build stronger relationships. And I've worked with folks, you know, I've worked with some folks in, in tech environments where they've got profound technical skills, but really struggle to interact with people. And after they go through, so, you know, this is why I wrote my book. Uh, building trust, exceptional leadership in an uncertain world. And in the courses that I deliver, I really try to help people understand, here's the levers and now here's how you pull them. And, you know, some of these tech experts have said to me, it's like you've given me a manual for dealing with people. Uh And, And the changes that we see come out of that are profound and lasting. And so, you know, it's so empowering and so positive to see people who have felt like the world is a hostile place all of a sudden find their stride and be able to engage the world in a better way um it's just incredibly rewarding work no you're absolutely right about that you know this this is that you know i i I, you know this is the one element that makes a difference so i recruit all the time you know for us recruiting goes all year round so one of my favorite questions when I interview somebody is, is uh, why do you want to leave the position you're at, right? So I usually ask that question. And uh, very often I get the answer. It's not about the money. It's not about that company. It's a simply the leadership that they, they, yes. they, they lost the trust with, right? So simply, you know, and especially with the, with the last couple of years, what I heard is, uh, you know, we don't know where the company is going or we don't know what's going on with the company. So we have no communication or or that's, right. you know, it's, it's a disconnect between those two, either trust or communication, something. So are you absolutely right about that? You know, I heard that story over and over. It's not because of the company or, or pay scale. It's simply they lost the trust with the leader. Right. 
And I, so I was doing some work with a tech company and they're a global organization and they measure trust levels for their leaders. And so they're kind of ahead of the curve because they actually measure it. And they know it's important, but they, they don't give them any suggestions about what to actually do about it. So it's like, Hey, you're not doing well. You need to fix that. Well, how do I fix it? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I worked with a subset of the, this organization and one of their leaders had received a score of 13 out of a hundred. Um, and the, her boss said to me, Hey, I just want you to coach this person, try to help them. And so she's actually a brilliant leader. She just got thrown into a setting that wasn't quite right for her. And there's some communication problems. And so I started walking her through the model and she started taking action and changing the way she behaved. And then I had a conversation with her and her group. And I said, here's what trust is and here's how it works. So benevolence is the belief that you've got my best interest at heart. What could she do to show benevolence? What would that look like? Because often we think we're being benevolent, but it doesn't land that way. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. when I work, when I work with families, I'll say to them who here has their kid's best interest at heart, all the hands will go up. But when I flip that question and I say, how many of your kids would say that it's about a third and really tentative at that. And so if it's not obvious in a place where it's supposed to be obvious, then how obvious is it when you're a leader and you've got multiple people that you're trying to look out for and an entire group that you're trying to help push and, and push towards a positive direction. Mm -hmm. And so we had this conversation with her team and we just systematically walked through the different elements of the model and said, how could she pull this lever? How could she be more intentional about this? And mm -hmm. now they all had the same vocabulary. And three months later, they did the survey again and her score went from 13 to 80. And since then she's been at a hundred. Wow. Such and a so, short period of time. Can you build that in such a short period of time in three months? Uh, you can do it in less time than that. Yeah. Wow. And, and part of it is being intentional. You know, I've worked in a couple of instances with, with fathers who were estranged from their kids who were struggling with that relationship. And within a month, they said complete change, you know, uh, from kids being scared of them and not wanting to engage and interact to their kids throwing themselves on them, telling them they love them, that they wanted them in their lives, mm -hmm. right? And so we can see profound changes. It's something we can be intentional about. Hmm. Quite interesting. So is that, is that more of a communication uh, uh, issue, uh, Daryl, or is it simply just changing your language a little bit, or is it just the way you, the way you, you know, is it a body language as a you know, side of it? So what are some of the changes that, you know, the person, or is it something you got to work on yourself and just, just the way you, way you, the way you think it through uh, certain things? That's a great question. And, and, and part mm -hmm. of it's a mix of those things. And, okay. and so part of it is uh, thinking about the other party. It's, it's, you know, empathy and it's being able to first think about them and then include them in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not going to say, because, one of the things we do is we'll say, oh, do you trust me? And people are reluctant to say no, right? Because it's it feels rude. Mm -hmm. And they they struggle with the same lack of awareness that you have. But if you change that vocabulary, if you change that conversation to talking about, okay, so uncertainty. Um, here's one of the templates I give people when they go when they're going through my course or in the book where I, I try to lay out everything for people. Mm -hmm. And so I'll say, you're going to talk to somebody about benevolence. So here's what you're going to do first. You're going to say, Hey, I was in this course or I heard this guy talk and he was, he was talking about this notion of benevolence, having someone else's best interest at heart. Yeah. And I th think I do that, but it doesn't always seem to land that way. Have you ever experienced that? Overwhelmingly the other person will say, Oh God, yes. Or I've seen it. Oh. And then you'll say, yeah. Have So have you ever had someone really have your back? What was that like? What did they do? How did it feel? And now you're starting to get them thinking about past experiences when someone's been benevolent, where, where they've had that experience where someone looked out for them. Mm -hmm. And you're getting hints about what benevolence looks like for them. Uh, and then so you, you put them through the same thing that, that what you were, you know. Yeah, you walk mm -hmm. them through this conversation and then you narrow the funnel and you go, what would it look like if I was benevolent to you? What does success look like for you? How do I help you get there? And so in my head, Gurmeet, I'm thinking that 
if your clients see this and they, they walk away going, I learned something from that conversation. I really want to keep listening to Kermit's podcast. Mm -hmm. That's positive for you. Right. And so I'm trying to be benevolent and I'm trying, I try to model those things. I try to model sort of the ability, the integrity, the benevolence piece. I try to explain my context. And so what we do is we give people these exercises that they're going to do and they, they pick a practice person. And what I would suggest for your audience is just pick someone you can practice with, not your best friend, not your worst enemy, someone kind of in the middle where you say, Hey, I just want to try to practice some of these skills. And yeah. they will be amazed at how positive people are about that. And so just slowly they start changing their behavior patterns mm -hmm. to being more intentional. And once we've started to develop trust with other people, they start giving us the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. I think that is, that is very important at all, what you just mentioned, you know, um, I, I, cause I hire a lot of younger people um, on ongoing basis Right. And, you know, I think a generational, generational gap also makes a lot of difference. My generation, generation before, you know, we were trusting, uh, we, we trust a lot of people. Yes. And, uh, you know, the younger people coming out of universities now, um, you know, they they they, they want to trust you, but they want you to, you know, uh, walk with the example. So they want to see the example of that as well before they give you a trust, right? So they want to see that, how do you, you know, uh, deal with the old days. And so they want to see examples of everything you do. And then they want to give you that trust. I think that's a little bit different as seeing you know, on both generations. Yeah. So if that's the case, then it's a, so important for leaders to to act and 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 uh, be example of being a trustworthy person before they can they can they can guide those people and coach those people. They can follow you because you gotta lead by example, I guess, right? So I think that's a lot more important than you know for, for that generation than previous generation. Absolutely. And the, the struggle that we face right now is that a lot of our relationships are a mile wide and an inch deep, right? And so our, the generation that's following us have been exposed to information from all over the world, yeah. but they haven't had a lot of experience in dealing with deeper relationships, having relationships that are resilient enough to survive a dust up or, or a challenge that we're, that we run across. They have a sm small attention span, right? What is small attention span? Yeah. And, and if, somebody says something offensive or that they don't agree with, or they misinterpret something, that person's gone and they find a new oh. one. And, and they don't have the experience of maybe you and I disagree about something. doesn't mean I care about you any less. Yeah. It means it's an opportunity for us to have a conversation and that we mm. need to figure out how to learn to work through it. You know, and, and I work on that with my sons. They're the center of my universe. And they're just about to turn 21 and 18 and they're thriving in the world because they've learned some of these skills about coping with conflict and mm -hmm. overcoming challenges and having conversations and not just giving up on things the minute it gets rocky or yeah challenging. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So one is business leaders got to build this, you know, they got to, they got to, uh, you know, adopt that. They got to, you know, but the second is teaching the same skill set to your team and coaching them and, and building that into the team so they can go on and and practice that on your client and, and build the companies. How big that challenge is, you know, yeah, you 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 gotta learn that, but then now you gotta train your people and, and coach your people to do the same what you did uh, with them. Yeah. So one of the uh, leaders I work with is a woman named Kelsey Trigg. Yeah. And she's just she's just brilliant. She's uh one of the best leaders I've seen. She works for SAP. So she has technological, technical people that she's working with and her team, she's the global head of HR advisors. So she's working with 8,000 leaders at SAP okay. um, from all over the globe and her team is all over the globe. And so there's different cultures, different everything. And she pretty consistently has remarkably high client scores and remarkably high team scores uh, and leadership scores. And she basically says that it, a lot of it stems from having the same vocabulary. So talking about, you know, uncertainty in a certain way, talking about vulnerability in a certain way. And once we start to have a shared vocabulary, it becomes less fuzzy, right? We, we take away a lot of the mystery because people interpret the world through stories. We have to be conscious of creating the same narrative for everyone and using the same language. And so that's one of the really powerful things, you know, I mean, uh, ideally I'd love it if everyone read my book 
because I'm, I'm trying to take, you know, I feel like I'm dropping small grains of sand in the ocean and creating these little ripples. What I want is people to come alongside me and pick up great big rocks mm-hmm. and dump them in the ocean and, and create a huge splash um, to counteract some of the negative things that we're seeing going on. Mm-hmm. And so absolutely, this is a place where people can lean in. And as they start to learn and grow, they can start having conversations with their teams and being able to say, hey, I've heard this guy talking about trust. Here's what his definition was. Does that make sense to you? What does that mm-hmm. mean in terms of, you know, there's elements of uncertainty and vulnerability. Well, how are we uncertain about each other? How are we vulnerable to each other? Just even having those conversations creates a hygiene where you're being more intentional. Yeah. Very interesting. You know, that is definitely, you know, what you just mentioned that, you know, on my podcast, I had a discussion with a Mark Davis a couple, couple of months ago. And on a similar topic, we were talking about the trust. So he's he's a, he's a business leader from New York. He'd written a couple of books on how to lead in a crisis. Yep. And uh, currently he's in Ukraine helping orphanage kids, um, you know, and uh, he helping them, uh, wow. you know, taking care of them. So he's been there for four or five years now, right? So even before he was there, now he's... So we were talking about the similar topic and, you know, that, you know, a lot of kids come in and they age from, you know, somewhere from three to all the way to 10, 11. And how do you, how do you, uh, how do you help these kids? And his approach was, you know, first thing is you got to build the trust with the, with the kids. You got to build the trust. Once they, when you build a trust, then definitely you can help them. But without a trust, there's no help. Right. So very interesting discussion, but at the same topic, we are talking about the, without a trust, there's nothing you can move, you know, especially in a business as well. Right. So. Yeah. When we create trusting environments, you know, we, we create better relationships with our suppliers, with our distributors, with our, with our employees, and most importantly, with our customers. Yeah. You know, I worked with a, a financial services firm, a mutual fund company, and I spent 18 months with them training everyone. And after 18 months, they hired Ipsos Reed to do a survey, found out the trust was the primary driver of the, of the tr- purchase decision. Mm-hmm. and that they were dramatically more trusted than any of their competitors. And this was in 2001 uh, or 2003, rather. Mm-hmm. And for the next two years, they generated 75 cents out of every dollar that came into the industry in Canada. They were dominant and they wow. were part of a global financial services organization that started sending teams from all over the world to figure out what they were doing because they were dominating, not just in Canada, but they were dominating globally. And wow. so we see this kind of positive movement, this kind of powerful impact from the ability to build stronger relationships. Well, it, it also, as to your point, it does provide competitive advantage. Um, yeah. It has a financial benefit. It, 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 it uh, provides that, that advantage over others. If you build that environment, definitely you're going to grow. Your productivity is going to go higher. You know, if you show trust with your staff, they're going to give you the same trust back. Yeah. Um, your productivity is going to go higher. Definitely, you know, you, you're going to excel at the, at the business compared to other business, yeah, your competitors. And you're going to be happier. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, you're going to have fewer headaches. A lot of times we, we hear people saying, I, you know, I would love to invest time in this, but I've got so many fires I'm fighting. Yeah. And, and what they don't realize is a lot of those fires are symptoms of underlying trust problems. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. So let's talk about yourself, uh, uh, Daryl. How, how did you get so good at that? How did, what what got you interested in this topic, and how do you get so good at this? Well, so I I was born and raised in a small town in northern British Columbia, hmm. uh, Canada, and it was pretty isolated. And so there was this strong sense of, you know, the strong should protect the weak, and we should help each other. And if mm-hmm. you're capable of helping people, you should. And so this developed a pretty strong level of empathy for me. Um, and I had some hard knocks, you know, sometimes a hard road's a good teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, I learned a, a heightened level of empathy for others because of some of the struggles that I went through in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it became clear that the world was feeling that for me when I was, you know, I'd be sitting on the bus and somebody would sit down next to me and say, I'm just really having a hard time. Mm-hmm. And so strangers would just come to me and, and start to unburden themselves. and. So I decided, you know, if, if this is going to keep happening, maybe I should get paid for this. Um, and so I moved towards a career in clinical psychology. And mm-hmm. I started working with families in crisis and troubled teens and street kids and uh, working on crisis lines and those kinds of things to hone those skills. And partway through, I realized that 
you know, a lot of the folks I was working with were just doing the best they could. And I thought if, if I spend my life trying to help people untangle challenges that, that have taken them, you know, years to, to create, Mm -hmm. it's probably going to drive me insane. And so I shifted, I, I did a master's degree in public administration. I worked in native land claims in British Columbia Mm -hmm. where they would ask me some deep philosophical questions like what is self-government or what will BC look like 50 years after claims are settled? And the last question they asked me was how do we convince a group of people we've shafted for over a hundred years, they should trust us. And I thought, wow, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went to Duke and wrote my doctoral thesis on building trust in hostile environments. Um, And I was fortunate to have two of the world's leading academic experts on my committee um after i finished after i finished my final defense the three of us were sitting having a drink and they said so we just wanted to tell you that when you first approached us with this topic we had a conversation with each other we said too complicated he never solves it and they said six months in you were so far beyond us we couldn't help anymore all we could do was sit and watch Mm -hmm. and here we are a couple years later we think you've solved it and I then uh, got hired by McKinsey and company to work as a consultant. Um, And so I got to start applying some of the concepts that I had studied theoretically. Uh, In 2001, I was involved in a car accident, ended up with post-concussion syndrome. And so I couldn't continue that path. But one of my former friends from McKinsey had become head of strategy for a mutual fund company. And he reached out to me and asked me to give a talk. And So I started applying the work that I had theoretically created. And I got to tell you, the learning curve over 20 years of helping people solve problems is so steep. You know, every time I engage with a client, every time I have conversations with a, with a person, I learn. Mm -hmm. And so I've got this blend of theoretical experience and exposure, but also this practical applied element. Um, and there's a bunch of things within my model that aren't included in others' models. You know, the mm. the conversation around vulnerability, the the piece around context that you identified, um, this notion of perceived outcomes where we talk about, you know, people interpret the world through stories. And so we, we need to be involved there. And then this sort of emotional states, whether we like or dislike somebody else, has mm-hmm. a pretty significant impact on how we view them. And 99% of the literature on trust treats people like they're rational actors. And I Mm. I don't know if you've met people before, but we're not always rational. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Um, Emotional. We have, have, you know, we can be rational. We, and, and so the more extreme those emotional states become, the less rational we are. Yeah. And this is, this is where the hostile environments piece comes in because when people hate each other, they have a hard time connecting. And so we need to try to reset those emotional states first. Mm-hmm. And I've been thrown into settings where people are struggling, where they dislike each other pretty intensely. And I've had success. Um, and, and partly it's about acknowledging the hurt, acknowledging the challenges that they have with each other, setting myself as, as a neutral third party, and then talking them through the model just mm-hmm. systematically and helping them understand each other and, and, and say, well, this is the perspective I have. You know, you talk about benevolence and I don't feel it from you. And here's the examples. And the other person says, oh, well, we don't really feel it either. And here's the examples. And then they're able to talk about, well, what would it look like if we actually cared about each other? If we tried to serve each other's best interest? What are some of the mm. things we could actually do? Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, so that it's been a long road of uh learning growth and development so on a problem solving step uh, from angle uh daryl you know you mentioned 100 years of uh, you know distrust environment or or smaller settings where where one on one is a smaller you know uh, issue yeah and conceptually is it a similar kind of problem that we trying to solve or you know definitely you mentioned the longer that that goes on definitely if it's 100 years you gone through generation after generation hate just builds up, you know, it's very hard to build that trust, you know, it, yeah. and or, or smaller set, like a one-on-one, it's maybe a smaller problem. So the conceptual is the same approach that you could solve both problem or totally different approach that, uh, that you got to use to deal with these problems. Well, the, the model holds, but 
but this the problems become more complex the the more people that are involved um and so i use the same model and and i've had the blessing of working across cultures and i've worked with people from literally all over the world and they overwhelmingly seem to say yeah this makes sense um and but it's different levers that have different impact and so you know if we think about as a leader the lever you're most worried about with your subordinates the people you lead is ability you want them to be able to do the task you want them to be competent and capable but the lever that they're most concerned about is benevolence they want to know that you have their interests at heart that you'll look out for them and so that same thing applies across all these different scenarios right and so uh when we sit down a lot of times you know i use this mantra of ask listen respond first we need to include the other person in the conversation to find out where the gaps are does it has it been a history of failed promises so that's an integrity violation how do how do we explain that how do we try to repair it is it a perceived lack of benevolence Mm-hmm. Well, how do we include them in that conversation and how do we start to signal more effectively what our care and concern is, or where's the overlap in our interests so that we can strive towards manageable, achievable goals first to start to build up a positive virtuous cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, is it ability? You know, we may, we may have, you know, when I work with senior executives, I'll say who here is a great leader and they'll all put their hands up and I'll say, this is fantastic. What does that mean? And I get these sort of this real stun kind of, I don't know, actually, now that you ask. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when I'm working with people, I'll say, who are the people that should be involved in defining what excellence is? And what are their takes on what good would look like? So, you know, if if I were to think about, here's what, here's what a great guest looks like on, on Gurmeet's podcast. I have a list of things in my head. Yeah. But if I don't include you in that conversation, I may be completely missing what you think a good guest looks like. And I may be completely missing what your listeners think a good le- guest looks like. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Does that change? And, uh, you know, we, we talked about the context earlier. We talked about business environment. We talked about communities. How about if you take it one step and look at, you know, armies or navies, you know, on, yeah. they have a totally different approach, a little bit more aggressive, I guess, right, to build a trust with each other. But their trust is so tied with each other, you know, they're willing to die for each other. So how do, how do, how do they do they use a different approach to build that trust? Or is it a similar kind of approach, just on a different level? So I've actually spent some time having conversations with the Canadian military. I, I uh, was approached by them to help them try to figure out how to build trust with the locals in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've recently had more conversations with them about, because they're, they're finding that it's in decline within the military. Um, historically they create a sense of shared objective, right? So there's an us against them mentality. There's this, uh, this deep belief that we need to work together collaboratively. Um, you know, but I had a conversation with a senior leader in the Canadian military who said, you know, our, our troops are starting to become less and less convinced that the leadership has their best interest at heart. Uh And I said, well, that's dangerous for you because that means if, if I don't think you're looking out for me and mine, the people that I, I love as brothers and, and would am willing to die for when the shit hits the fan, my first round is probably in the back of your head. Yeah. And he said, yes, people fall down a lot. And he said, so it's, it's a problem that we're, we're grappling with right now. Um, this sort of decline in belief that the leadership actually has the best interest of those they lead at heart. Um, and it, it has potentially fatal consequences in those settings, Mm -hmm. but a lot of it is, you know, uh, a real strong level of empathy for one another because you're going through the same things you're in the same situation you have the same goals and objectives you're able to create this really high trust high performing team there's an interesting piece by simon Sinek when he talked about working with navy seals and he said he he divided trust into ability and and trust i don't do that but but on his measure he said navy seals are more concerned with trust than they were with competence Mm -hmm. and so they were 
you know, they would love to have somebody who's really high on the trust dimension and really high on the ability dimension. But if they had to take somebody who was lower on one, they would choose the trust dimension first every time. Yeah. Well, if it's a co- in a competent, you you may be able to help each other out. But on a right. trust, there's no helping. You use trusting other people, for, you know, with your life because, um, yeah. you know, they're going to get your best in trust. Right. So um, I'm not surprised that trust got to be higher, um, I guess. Right. So, yeah. y- you know, they trust you with your with your life. You know, um, y- you may have something, some control over their life. Right. So right. you got to trust competent level. Yeah. Maybe maybe we can help each other out to, you know, how, to 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 achieve whatever we're trying to achieve. Right. We can build skills. We can play to your strengths. There's always all kinds of ways we can compensate for, for that. Yeah. But if I just fundamentally don't trust you, that's hard for me to cover for, and it puts me at risk. And we see this in high-performing teams everywhere. Wow. Very, very critical. You know, definitely, you know, they, they you know, for them. So with the kids who are growing, you know, my, my, my kids a little as well. So does the sports ha- have built some sort of characters in 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 kids that 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 do help them develop trust or or you know uh, what can you do what can you teach kids how do how do you teach kids to to build this 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 uh, you know character of uh, right. trustworthy so this is one of the things you know when my kids were young um i worked really hard at building as strong a relationship with them as i could and when my <clears throat> oldest was 12 years old he looked at me one day and he said Dad, even when you're upset with me, I know it's about what's best for me. And I thought, I'm winning, right? And so mm-hmm. a big part of it is, and, and I, I've i got articles that talk about trust and parenting on my website at trustunlimited.com. There's a, there's a good piece there that talks about creating a relational approach to building trust with our kids because we want them to come to us, yeah. right? We don't want them to go to their buddy or their girlfriend or whoever asking questions that are going to have a profound impact on their lives. We want to be the ones they turn to because no one cares more about them than we do. And and their friends don't have as much experience as we do. And so, you know, I have built profoundly strong relationships with my sons through communication and modeling and showing them empathy. And, you know, they understand that I'm not perfect. And I've been taking strong steps to make that clear, right? Mm-hmm. And I I acknowledge when I mess up and I explain, you know, what I was doing wrong or why I felt my my response wasn't appropriate. Um and so we've created an environment where they are actually remarkably resilient. Mm-hmm. And I think it's I think it's future proofing our kids. And so a big part of it is having conversations with them about Okay, so you know, and sports can be helpful because it gives them a sense of team or a mm-hmm. sense of competition or of how to challenge themselves and grow and develop. Um, you know, there are all kinds of ways that they can engage with the world socially uh, and and build these skills of how do I manage conflict? How do I mm-hmm. how do I think about somebody else's best interest, not just my own? Mm-hmm. Uh, how do I think about long term consequences? rather than just getting what I want in the moment. Mm-hmm. And so for my sons, it's been a long uh, journey of, you know, I have a relentlessly positive story about them. Um, I try to, you know, I talk about us making mistakes. We step on a rake, you know, and the, the rake comes up, the rake handle comes up and hits you in the face. Yeah. And for a long time, I would say to my kids, look out, there's a rake, look out, there's a rake watch out for that rake. And then I realized all they're learning is, Hey, dad knows where the rakes are. Yeah. And so I, I took a step back and I walked alongside them. And then when they stepped on a rake, I would say, man, that looked like that hurt. Yeah. What was it that might've given us a signal that that was coming? And how do we so respond? Watch that? Out. Yeah. Yeah. So they start to learn where the rakes are. And, and when they do step on one, cause we all do, you say, how do we respond now? Because things happen in life. It's how we respond that matters. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and and modeling that be- behavior of asking questions, taking a Socratic approach or a coach approach where we come alongside them and we start to ask them questions about, well, what do you think the other person's story is? 
And it's a muscle that they can develop and grow. And, you know, I think my sons have had the benefit of hearing me talk about this for their whole lives. You yeah. know, when they were really little, they started to learn, you know, my oldest son uh, was in one of those play areas at McDonald's mm -hmm. and he refused to come down and it was time for us to go. And I had to crawl up and get him. Okay. And those things aren't those structures aren't designed for guys my size right yeah. like i'm six three i'm 220 <laughs> pounds at the time yeah. and so i finally pretzel myself in there and i get to him and he's got this terrified look on his face like he thinks i'm going to yell at him or something and i just said i need you to remember this moment because we're not coming back here for a really long time and we slid down and we got up and we left three months later we're driving past that mcdonald's and he's in the back seat and he says hey there's that mcdonald's we haven't been there in a really long time. Yeah. And I said, yeah, we haven't. Do you remember why? And he said, yeah, because I wouldn't come down when you called me. And so my kids learned that when I said something, I meant it. I didn't make false promises. There was a lot of integrity in what I did. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, he learned from that, that when we, whenever we went to another place with a play area, he would say, I'm going to go to the play area now. Here's where I'll be. If you need me, you just call and I'll come right away. That's great. Uh -uh. And, you know, we fast forward a couple of years and his little brother starts to have a temper tantrum in the back seat. And I hear him say, you're just wasting your time with dad. That never works. Mm -hmm. Like he never gives into tantrums Yeah. and you need to find something. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's the message I've given him his mm -hmm. whole life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and being able to be steadfast in those moments, but to still reassure, right? So mm -hmm. when my kids were having their worst full on wobblies, I would say, even in this moment, I still love you. Mm -hmm. And, and predictably they would say, I don't love you. I hate you. And I'd say, that's okay. Yeah. And you're allowed to change your mind whenever you like, but I can't, I love you. Uh. And there, so that safety that safe harbor that we give them from which they can take risks mm -hmm. from which they can go out in the world you know a place where they're loved and accepted for who they are and it doesn't mean we don't give them feedback but we give them feedback in a way that's not damaging mm -hmm. that's not belittling yeah 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 so that that is you know well very touching what you just uh walked you know uh the share with us uh you know, and it's the same skill that that you know applies in a work environment with the companies, the business leaders, right? Exact same approach, right? So, especially what we just gone through for the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, if you had a, that that safe environment built in, you know, I, I I learned during this last couple of years, I could solve my own, you know, I could solve a lot of business problems, you know, and and uh, but I do have a blind spot because I'm you know I'm a one person looking at one angle, then I'm trying yeah. to grow a company. But the people working for me, they know those blind spots are. I know if I leave the decisions to them and let them figure out what the problem is and what how to solve those problems, very often they come up with a better solution than I would have come up with. Yeah. And this is one of the places, you know, this is a, a profound piece of wisdom that you have because a lot of leaders are struggling with the fact that they have to let go of certain things. Yeah. And when we do that, when we let go of the things that we're good at, and step into new roles that are more unfamiliar for us, we're going to make mistakes Yeah, because this is a new muscle we're, we're exercising a new skill we're trying to build and develop. Mm -hmm. And so we need to have the courage to be able to do that and model that for those who lead because yeah. the environment's changing so fast. We can't just be good at what we used to be good at. We have to learn new skills. We have to be flexible. We have to be adaptive and innovative. And that means we're going to fall down. Yeah. And, you know, people around you, if they, if they got the back to the trust, if they have your best in trust, they're not going to let you fall. You know, they're going to figure out how to get get around those, you know, problems. Right. right? So they're, so, they're going to be there problem solving with you. Right? Exactly. So and they will solve some of the problem better than you could solve by yourself. Right. Yeah. So and, and it, it goes back to the building that trust that you just trusted them to solve the problem. And then they solve the problem that just, you know, it builds a trust with the uh, you know, working yeah. environment. Right. So. Well, and here's here's one of the pieces that I find really profound. I was working with a set of senior executives and they were talking about how empowering it felt to do something positive for somebody else. Right. It feels good to be able to help somebody. Yeah. 
And they were talking about these moments in their lives where they'd made a, a significant difference for someone or even a small moment where they'd been positive to somebody. And I said, this is really fantastic. So now explain to me why you're so effing selfish. Because you're never allowing other people to have that opportunity with you. Wow. Mm -hmm. You're never letting other people help you be successful. Yeah. Think about how powerful that would be for somebody if you were able to turn to them and say, you know what? I just need some help with this. Yeah. Yeah. And let, let and and very often, you know, you could have a one set of solution, but you know, they would come up with a totally different solution that you would, you know, you, you haven't thought about. Right. Yeah. And and that's where the you know a lot of business leaders talk about innovation, but that's where the innovation comes from, not from your ideas, your way of doing things. You know, if if that was a case that you could innovate everything by yourself, but it's right. letting other people around you make those make make those decisions and come up with a solution so they can find a different solution than what, what you were trying to figure out. Well, and if we create an environment where there's high levels of trust and feelings of psychological safety, then people are willing to fail. And yeah. we don't innovate without failure. They're willing to take risks, make mistakes, be creative, and know that they're not going to get punished for it. Yeah. That's how we create it. It's a feedback. Learn from it and let's move on. Yeah. Very interesting. Hey, I learned so much from our discussion. I think the business leader we're watching, definitely there's a, so much so much wisdom to take away and learn from from from, uh, from you. Uh, where can uh, you know where can they get more information about you, Daryl? And where can they uh, buy your book from? Um, to share your you know how can they connect with you? So people can reach out to me if they want at Daryl D A R R Y L at trustunlimited.com. You can check out my website trustunlimited.com, and in the blog section, there's all kinds of articles and podcasts that they can check out. Um, I would be delighted if people had helped me spread the word. So the book's available anywhere you buy books online. Um, so Amazon or Chapters or Indigo, uh, Barnes and Noble, and it's available as a hard copy or an ebook or as an audio book. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. You know, I'm going to include links to all that below the video as well. People, can, you know, they can click a button and 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 uh, just just uh, order the book. Uh, but it, I learned so much from our discussion. I think the business leader watching, they're going to learn so much, but I would encourage them, hey, you know, click a link, you know, reach out to you, have a conversation. Absolutely. But, you know, we all got a blind spot. This is the area, I think, uh, as as we we started discussion, business is about people and people about building a relationship, building trust, yeah. so important for business leaders. And I think for the last couple of years, it just got very, very important, as you mentioned, yes. um, that, that you know, you just can't build a business without it. You know, it's, it's, it's supposed to provide you competitive advantage and uh, over others. And that's, this is my passion. This, these are the things I care most about. Uh, very interesting. Any message for business leaders? I know that a lot of them, they're trying to, uh, you know, we, we had a couple of years of slow. Now they're trying to scale up their companies. You know, they got to build a new teams. You know, they, they, they're looking for more people and, uh, you know, it, it there's so many challenges they're up against and any word of wisdom, any message you want to leave for them? Uh, uh, We're all scrambling right now. So, so let's have care and concern for each other. It's the thing we have control over. So patience with those you're hiring, clear communication, and intentionality with, with your customers. If there's, if there's blips in the road or challenges that we're facing, being clear with people, Hey, we're all learning. It's a, it's a new world. We're all trying to, get better and our aspiration is to serve you in the best way we possibly can communication goes a long ways yeah makes a world better place you know um it, it sure it just you know people around you they're happy you know you know you build a much better environment to excel yeah very yeah. interesting yeah one technology for the time you spend with me i know we got a little bit over but it was just such an interesting topic and i was just learning so much from you i think uh leaders who are watching they will take away so much value from our discussion as well daryl I thank you so much, Grameet, for the opportunity. All right. Thank you so much for time. We'll talk soon, Daryl. Okay. All bye. Right. Bye-bye.